welcome back. We are going to be hanging out today with my good girlfriend, Constance. I told her she has to come back on. I didn't give her a choice, so (laughs) I'm just kidding. She gladly accepted this invitation, this glorious invitation, because today we're going to hang out as two girlfriends. We're going to talk about some hot topics that I think all of you guys are going to be able to relate to on some form or another, whether it's your first year or your 20th or 30th year in the industry. It doesn't matter. We all have stuff that we can, uh, that just bridges the gap together. And that has to do with salon ownership and just some of the things that landed us into the decisions that we made as business owners and salon owners. So hello, Constance. How are you doing today? (laughs) Hello. Oh, quite nice. Um, I'm doing well. (laughs) I don't know what the accents. I don't know. Just us being weird. Um, Yeah. A warning to the audience, like uh, if you have never hung out with us in person. Like we bring out the weird in each other. And so, um, just a little, just a little disclaimer. <laughs> we do. And I don't know what it is. Like, even when I was a child, I would, or like child, when I was in like, uh, middle school and high school, did you used to do the fake accents? I feel like we talked about this before. Oh, like I would full on be like, okay, like me and my friend would be like, okay, we're going to go to Disneyland. And then all day we're going to be British. And like, <laughs> Thought we sounded so... (laughs) British is always my go-to. Yeah, like so convincing. And I'm sure like the people who heard us were just like rolling their eyes. I'm sure it's probably terrible accent. But yeah, I was a theater kid. And so like anything to... Oh, and and I hung out with... I had some like cousins who lived in Georgia. And then like I just wanted to all of a sudden have a Southern accent because I thought it was just so so cool to be different you know and they're like well you have an accent and I'm like no I don't but it's like yes Californians for sure have an accent like whenever I go to the south people are like I just love your accent I'm like I don't have an accent (laughs) but to them I do (laughs) but yeah I would always try to attempt to do an accent very poorly and I'm sure same thing I probably annoyed other people around me and like my best friend at the time she would try she would attempt a different accent and it would always like go into a southern accent somehow she would start out with like a scottish accent or like a irish accent and it would slowly morph into a southern accent like, what just happened the only the only scottish accent i can do is i can imitate merida when she goes like <laughs> this sounds so stupid now guys don't laugh okay like when she's like our fate lives within us <laughs> it's only what is you just have to be brave enough to take it or something i don't know that totally sounded like irish or i, I probably didn't even sound irish see i'm gonna give up okay let's move on <laughs> Okay, so the hot topic we are going to be covering today is salon ownership, but I kind of want to talk about how we arrived to that because it's not like we're like, oh, I'm going to just do hair and I'm going to open up a business all at the same time. And you and I both have been in the industry for a very long time. And I I want to talk about the journey that we've been on. So starting out with you, Constance in the hot seat over here. A very, very long time. <laughs> we are so old. <laughs> We're, we are, we're seasoned veterans. I remember there was this time, oh gosh, I can't even go there because I'm going to end up, I have like total ADD right now. (laughs) I swear I can't focus on the subject, but I, I think with the knowledge that we have, the experiences that we've been through, it's such a relatable piece for so many of us in this industry. And I think it can be really frustrating when we're in a place and we don't know what we're, what's going to come out the other end. We're like, are we going to just be stuck here forever? And why is it so frustrating for me? And why am I having such a hard time? It's like, uh, I think we're both here to let you guys know that it, you're not alone and everyone goes through this and anyone who acts like they're not, it's because they're not showing you the other part of it. And so when we first started, yeah, it was scary in the beginning. And I want to hear a little bit more, Constance, like how you started your career, how'd you arrive to being an independent stylist and then moving into salon ownership. So like, where did it all start for you? Well, and also, like you said that, um, you know, sometimes we can feel stuck. Like, are we going to be stuck in this forever? Like, I've also had the experience of like, I'm happy here. Like I could spend the rest of my career here. And then all of a sudden your mind changes or your, all of a sudden your passion, like you realize like, Oh, I want to do this now. And like, that's okay too. Like I said in the very beginning, when I first started doing hair, I will never be a salon owner. I'm like, hairdressers are very hard people to please because like, you know, we're creative people and like, you know, uh, it's kind of like herding cats sometimes like dealing with hairdressers, like, you know, cause like we just want to be all over the place. And so I swore up and down that I would never be a salon owner. And then, um, you know, and then things shift and change. And so, and, and I also said that I would never, 
um, not be behind the chair. And, and as I've gotten older, I realized like, you know, my passions have shifted to where like, yes, I, you know, like I love doing hair, but like, I also really love like empowering other hairdressers and like making people feel confident in their businesses. And so like things always ebb and flow and change. And like, that's okay for you to not have like the end result of your career the way that you would imagine when you first got into the hair industry. And, um, and it's cool. Cause like, as hairdressers, like we can wear so many different hats. Like we don't just have to be, um, you know, only doing haircuts or only being a color specialist or only being an educator or only working at a beauty school or, you know, what, or only being a salon owner. Like there's so many things that we can do. We can do all of them. We can do focus just on one or it can change and shift as the years go by. And so, um, I've kind of worn all the different hats. Well, I think all the different hats, most of them. Um, I started as a hairdresser when I was, I got licensed when I was 19. So I went to beauty school while I was in high school. And so I did the ROP program. So thankfully I got my education for free, which was like a great opportunity because a lot of people have to pay out of pocket. But, um, I started like as a baby in the industry, like just very, very like wide eyed and bushy tailed. Um, I, and I, and I was going to college at the same time. I, I was a theater major. You know, we were talking about being weird theater people. I am one of those. Um, and, uh, and I thought hairdressing was going to be like my like good job, like, you know, to make me money while I was in college. And my minor in college was psychology. And then as time went on and I was more exposed to the beauty industry, I realized that like theater and hairdressing are kind of kind of similar you know if you've ever been to a hair show you've seen people on stage they very much are like kind of like rock stars and then you know like I think it's pretty pretty common to talk about how your hairdresser is your therapist you know and so it's like I could be a therapist without like the years and years of college debt (laughs) so I was like oh this is really cool and so I put my focus into that and I I started a salon as a commission stylist then I moved to booth rental and then I was booth rental for quite, quite some time. And then I just had gotten to the point where I'd been to like a couple different salons, some high end, some like mom and pop, some like in between. And I just was never really like satisfied with um, answering to somebody else. Um, I'm a Gemini. So um, if that means anything to anybody, <laughs> I just was really never okay with like, you know, I've always like respected authority, but like I had a hard time giving respect when like I didn't feel the respect back. And, um, and so then that's when like the whole studio thing, like really started to like become a little bit, uh, more common. And, um, so I got my own studio, loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I ended up expanding to a bigger studio right when like Instagram was like really just like blowing up and I wanted to have my studio had no windows in it so I wanted to have like better lighting you know a bit a bit more room because my studio was like 99 square feet so it was just like very hard to like take photos in there and I had an assistant at the time and so it was just getting a little crowded so I ended up opening a two-chair studio and then after being there for two years for me that was always kind of like the in-between because I knew I wanted to open a salon but um I was just like waiting for the right space. And then all of a sudden the right space just kind of like, I don't, it kind of like hit me in the face kind of. And I was like, Oh, this isn't for me. Like it was, it was really run down and really, really ugly and very dated. And, um, and then I just like something kept telling me to like keep looking at that space. And then I, I mean, it's a very long story, but basically like I discovered that I can like open up the roof because it had those like ceiling tiles that just made it feel like really low and like the lighting was really bad. And then I was able to, you literally rose the roof. (laughs) I literally raised the roof. Um, and, uh, and there was a hidden skylight and that's when I knew I was like, this is my place. And so we, now we have like, yeah, we have like, I I think it's like 20 foot ceilings or something ridiculous with a skylight in it. And I was like, yes. And as a lover of plants, I'm like, yes, light. So um, I ended up opening collective and I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to run the salon, not as, um, not, not as a environment that I was used to being and where like, where I was like the boss, I wanted to just be there as a resource to empower the stylists that were there. And I wanted to kind of have like a 
like a happy medium between like a studio and like a traditional salon. So I didn't want to micromanage them. I didn't want to, you know, again, be their boss, but I wanted it to have more community and more um, connection than a studio. Cause sometimes studios can feel a little bit isolating. And unless you're going to hair shows all the time and all that kind of stuff, like you feel pretty, um, pretty cut off from the hair, the hair industry when you're in a studio. Um, if you are like an extrovert and you need that energy from other people. And so Um, my, my goal was to be the salon owner that I always needed someone that didn't like literally breathe down my neck, but someone that would support me if I needed it. And so that was my goal with collective. And so now I'm a salon owner. Well, those are all good reasons. I could totally understand the journey that you've gone through. Like even you describing it, which you did a really great job of describing it. Cause I, I literally felt like I was walking through these memories with you. (laughs) But I think the key thing that I pulled away from it is that you were really you went for it, you tried it out, and then you kind of shifted from there and you moved into other elements of it. And I think sometimes I I almost feel like this could be a totally separate podcast in itself that you and I could talk about like those perfectionist qualities. Cause I have found the number one thing to hold people back from doing whatever it is that they could be called to do, or they could grow into doing, or they've always wanted to do is their perfectionism or their, their fear of failure or their fear that it's not going to go the way they thought it would. And so they just don't do it. And, uh, you know, even when I talk to people about putting themselves out there on Instagram or starting to educate or things like that, they're scared to do it because they're like, well, cause they compare themselves to somebody who's been doing it for 10 years or whatever. And it's like, well, they, they had to start somewhere, you know? And so, and, and unfortunately we don't see the failures. We don't hear about the failures. We don't hear about like all the stuff that led up to it. So just even hearing your journey and how you were able to kind of like seasonally change through things and morph into the next part of your, of your career is important to hear that. And I feel like also just even the learning lessons, like even just hearing you talk about that. I mean, we can kind of hear some of those learning lessons and what made you get there, but do you feel like there were some aha moments or some huge learning lessons where you're like, this is something that or I don't know, just like anything in general, learning lessons in your career that you have stood out to you? Well, I mean, I I think opening a salon or even a studio, I mean, there's so many, I I mean, any, any aspect of any sort of growth, there's going to be like a million learning lessons. And like, you know, we don't, we don't grow unless like we're uncomfortable. And so there's a lot of growth happening, like in that time. I mean, and like you said, like people don't see like the struggles and the failures that are happening. Like, they didn't see like me, like hysterically crying, okay, dramatic, again, a Gemini, hysterically crying in a Home Depot, sitting on a pile of lumber with my husband, like not being able to make a decision about like the salon because like, you know, it was quoted X amount of dollars for the construction and then it kept going up and up and up and I was freaking out. Like nobody sees that part, you know? Gotta love those quotes. Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, they don't see the, the uncomfortable conversations that you have to have with like, your salon owner or like your sweet, your sweet owner or, you know, your team, like when you build a team. And, and I think that, um, over the course, like the, the underlying like lesson that has completely shown itself over and over and over again to like be beneficial for me is, is boundaries. And I know that like that word is used so much now, but for me, like, like when I first started, when I was a commission stylist, I would, you know, quote somebody when they came in, this is like, you know, pre-Instagram, this is like back in like 2004, 2005, someone would come in, you know, a client from the front desk and they would, you know, ask for highlights. And then they come in and they have like a major color correction and they're, you're, they're booked for just a highlight and they were quoted for just a highlight. And then, you know, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, over deliver because I'm a people pleaser because I'm a hairdresser and my pride's in the way. So I'm going to give them the, the best thing possible. And then all of a sudden, you have to go charge them and then you charge them what they were quoted. And then you're losing money because you have to pay commission to your salon owner. And you realize that you actually lost money on that service because of all the color that you use, because there was no boundary to begin with. There was no consultation. And I think now because of Instagram, I think hairdressers have become a lot more privy to like, you know, setting that, that boundary in the beginning and like having that in-person consultation beforehand and, you know, talking about prices and stuff. But like, that is so important to the, to now, even as a salon owner, like when I hired, um, my team, the, in the interview process, there was like a salon culture handbook that they were given of like, what's expected and like, what, 
um, you know, we don't have a dress code, but like there's things that are like, this is kind of like what's expected, like to, to show respect to your, your fellow stylists and to other clients, like, or, um, like with, with rent, they know rent's going up every year and there's a set amount and it's in their contract. And so when their anniversary comes around, there's no arguing of like, or that awkward conversation of like, Hey, you know what, Ambrosia, like, you know, it's been another year and like my rent's going up and you know, like I have to raise your rent too. And like inflation. And it's like, no, it's like, they, they already know that, you know, on their anniversary date, they get another week of vacation that, that resets. And then they, you know, they know that their rent is going to go up to X amount of dollars. And so having that, that conversation beforehand and setting those boundaries beforehand and having it in black and white allows you to just breathe and not have that like sense of uh, sick feeling when you have to confront something, uh, somebody about something, because my characteristics is like, I just kind of back off. I'm like, Oh, it's okay. I just, I won't like, I'll just let them walk over me or like a client, like, it's okay. I'll throw in that extra toner. They really need it. And it's in a, you know, I know I didn't tell them about it and I really don't want to charge them that extra $20. So it's okay. Like I just, I, I'll just give it to them for free. And then you've been doing that person's hair for 10 years. And all of a sudden that person's getting charged like 50% less than everybody else in your chair. And then you're resentful of them. And it's just like, it eliminates all those bad feelings. If we just communicate from the beginning, it's business and we set it in black and white. And that way there's no room for that scary, icky feeling that we get later on. Yeah. I mean, raise your hands if you've ever been in that position. I know I have. I know. I think every single person that's listening to this, if you're not, if you haven't, then you are a unicorn and I want, I want to find out what your magic is. But um, on top of it, setting your expectations are, that's huge. Setting your expectations in general, even setting expectations for yourself. I was, before we even got on this, um, you know, this wonderful podcast today, we were actually talking about how, me personally, I'll just share this with you guys straight up. I have, I don't set expectations for myself sometimes, or I set unrealistic expectations. I am very thorough with the notes that I take for the, um, my goals sheet and my list. And I have like this whole, like, I love organization and I like to have everything out in black and white so that I can get a better snapshot of what, what's going to be most important to finish on my task list. But you guys, I mean, sometimes like being realistic about how long something's going to take is both healthy for yourself and for other people that you are, you know, that you're servicing. And the more organized you can be with that for yourself, then the more set up for success you can be for others. Same thing goes if you're running a business, setting up those expectations ahead of time, getting that hard stuff out of the way, the business side, you know, that needs to be separated a little bit from the personal stuff too anyway. So I'm glad that you talked about that. So we understand that at some point you decided like, okay, I'm going to open up my salon and this is going to happen. And we've, we've also talked about this extensively at what point, like when you're like, okay, I want to open up my salon and this is what I want it to look like. Cause there's so many different models that we want that could happen in our industry. And I feel like that's probably the biggest thing that's ever changed is that there's no really set way in running that business. There's so many different ways that we can run a business now. Um, and there's so many different ways to get in, in, or there's so many different ways of getting revenue or income streams coming in as well. What made you decide how you wanted to run your salon specifically? Um, it was kind of a combination of like what I wish existed for me, like what I, like if I could build a salon to work at what I would want from a salon owner. And then also like realistically looking at my life and the, and the time that I have and the time that I want to spend on my business. Because at the time when it opens when I opened my salon, I was traveling a ton, doing a ton of education with, I work for Matrix. So traveling all around with them and even doing like photo shoots and like, you know, partnerships, like with my friends, like Ambrosia, like doing photo shoots and stuff like that. And I knew that like having to be in my business and running it and, you know, having employees was just like, number one, not realistic with the schedule that I had. And then also not, not something that like made me feel good. Like, I didn't want to micromanage. Like it just wasn't something I was interested in. And, you know, baby hairdresser Constance would always said like, I never want to manage hairdressers. And that still rang true, even though I became a salon owner. So I looked for stylists that were independent, like awesome, strong, you know, bosses, you know, that could, could run their own business that like basically would be the kind of people that would have a studio, but we're looking for more community. 
Um, and, and I am there for them, like for business coaching or social media coaching, or even for formulas. Sometimes I'll get a text like, Hey, I'm doing a redhead. Like I'm thinking of using this, like, what do you think? You know? And it's like, I am, you know, like 100% so happy when they reach out to me like that, but I didn't want to be like talking with, you know, uh, like, a a commission stylist and, and walking them through like how to do a highlight from scratch. Like I had tried that with my assistant and, and it was great. It was really nice to, to mentor somebody, but it's so, it's so involved. It's like, you, it, I mean, it really takes so much energy and time to put into another human like that. And I knew that I just didn't have the capacity for that. And now being a new mom, I definitely don't have the time for that. And so I'm really grateful that this was the model that I had set up because at the time I wasn't even thinking about becoming a mom yet. And so it was really good that like, I hadn't, like, I don't need to be in my business, you know, tr- you know, all the time to, um, you know, cause they're, they're freaking badasses. Like they know what they're doing and they're like really, really good at hair and they're really good at running their business. And so I think you have to objectively look at yourself and like, I think sometimes we can be a little bit of overachievers and think like, Oh, I can do that. I can do everything. Like I can, I can have, you know, my independent uh, education and I can be in the salon full time and I can coach people and I can, you know, have 30 employees and I don't need to hire anybody else to help me. And they think they can do all this stuff. And it's like, and then you end up being burnt out. And then I think that's where a lot of these salon owners that are, um, like they're the type of salon that I was leaving to be independent. Like that, I think it was the salon owners were just burnt out. They just were trying to do everything. And, um, and they just weren't happy. And so, um, yeah, you just kind of have to have like a real, like a real conversation with yourself and see like what you want to do. And there are people out there who are like really good with that. Like you were one of them, like really good with numbers, really good with sp- spreadsheets and like, um, like just so like organized in that way. And I'm just not that person. And so like, I think you just have to, you know, you have to be honest with yourself, like what, what you want your life to look at, look like. And if you want a salon like that, that's fine. But you like, and you're not, and if you're like me, you're like not good at that kind of stuff. You've got to be okay with hiring somebody because like, like you can't be good at everything, you know? I mean, you are, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not good at everything. But I think one of the biggest things to kind of keep in mind for you listeners that are listening in right now, um, whether you own a salon already or you're thinking of owning a salon or, you, or you're like, Constance's journey who says, I never want to own a salon. And then someday you're like, oh, just kidding. <laughs> I digress. Like the, sometimes you can't shift. It's okay. Like it's totally fine. If I, I even said the same thing. I was like, nope, not interested in owning a salon, but it's an extension of your culture. And so the, the more you understand your culture and just the modality of how you move through your business and what you want, you are going to attract those kind of people as well. And so the more you attract those type of people, then the more responsibility it can bring depending on where you want your role to sit. And so if you were in a commission basis, uh, you're in a place where you're going to be nurturing a little bit more and bringing up that stylist to, you know, be more of a fruitful stylist. Right. And so it will take a couple of years on average. It takes about two years in order for the business to start actually either breaking even or making money. So yes, there is an investment piece that goes into it, but oftentimes statistically they, there are deeper roots with that too. So the investment happens on both ends and eventually it could become an exit strategy for the salon owner if they were to either want to sell it or if they wanted to turn it into an S corp and offer profit sharing options two stylists. So that's where it kind of becomes a little bit more, I guess you can make it a more robust business in, in a sense. Same thing could happen though, if you had a, a, a salon where you're doing booth rental as well, because you could eventually sell that business to somebody if you had like a good profit and loss sheet that you can show to them. And it could be something too, like with Constance is saying, if you want to get into education, if you want to go travel, if you want to do uh, stage work, platform work, then being able to do that and b- do it effectively and run a salon at the same time, you got to make sure that your salon platform is going to be sustainable if you're not in it. And if you're not, if it, if it isn't and it crumbles or not crumbles. That's a little dramatic. <laughs> Just staying on theme with the whole drama theme. But it, you know, if you're not there for like, let's say two or three weeks and you know, somebody is waiting on an answer and you're not there for them or you're not in the salon to be there for them and you need to be there to nurture that environment 
then that can make your business unstable. And if realistically you can't be there all the time, then having a different type of business model, walking in with it, just knowing like, okay, this is what I want to start with. You can always change it too. It can always like grow and build. And that's, what's the best part about business is that it's not as black and white as I think sometimes people think it is. But um, anyway, so that was good advice. I like that. I feel like you spoke to a lot of people who, you know, they want to have options and they still want to have the responsibility of nurturing an environment that feels, you know, like an extension of them. And you're bringing people in that are like, have them, they, they share that importance for the same culture, which is, you know, I think it's sometimes people don't think about those things honestly, like when I talk to some stylists. Well, and I think also people think that like, oh, I've been doing hair for X amount of years. So it's like my next step is logically to own a salon. Like they think that that's like the end all, like like the retirement of like the hair industry. Oh my God. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Yeah. Talk more about that. And it's, first of all, first of all, it's not because like, it's (laughs) being like, I always thought like being a salon owner was like easy peasy, right? Like, like you're just like, oh yeah, I just go in and do a couple clients. And then like, I just, you know, people just pay me money and like, I get all the money, but it's like, first of all, like salon owners don't make like, they're not rolling in the dough first of all, unless like you have like a massive salon, several locations. And like, you have like this machine like running and like, you kind of have to be okay with, sorry, you can hear baby crying. Sorry. Um, you have to be like, I don't know, like, okay, like, I don't want to say cutthroat because like, I don't want to say like these successful salon owners are all cutthroat, but like some are. Um, and also like, like you have to invest like, like, I mean, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars into your salon to be able to like be getting that return on investment. So it's not always the case of like, that's like your like retirement plan or whatever. Cause it's just like, it is a lot of work um, to, to have a salon that's like raking in the dough. Like my salon again, like it's very, like, like very self-sufficient. Like doesn't mean that I'm not in, involved, but I'm much less involved than like a traditional salon owner. Um, but like the end all is it's like, it doesn't make you a successful stylist if you are a salon owner. And just because you're a really good stylist doesn't mean that you'll make a good salon owner also. Um, and also the end all isn't always having a studio either. Like some people just don't like, there's a lot of stuff involved in having a studio that people don't like, they're like, Oh yeah. Like I have to like buy my own back bar and I have to like do my own towels. Like that's not a big deal. Like I do towels in my salon, but they don't realize that like, if you don't do your towels, nobody else will do the towels. And then you can go in and have nothing but like wet, gross towels and then be screwed, you know, or be okay with like spending the money on a towel service, which is what I did because I just like, I knew, I knew my personality. I was like, I'll just pay someone. And, um, and like your same with like your back bar and like your color and stuff like that. Like there were, there were times that like I ran out of color and I would go studio to studio and be like, hi, do you have 506 N? And they would be like, no, I don't use matrix. I'm like, you know, do you have 506 N? They're like, well, I have, I have 508 and then I have like six RR and I'm like, well, I'll I'll try to make it work, you know? And like, you just, you can't just like, it's a lot different than having the community of, of a full salon. And, um, and while it's like really cool to have like that one-on-one where you can have like your own conversations in your studio, like if, if there's like a conflict or if there's like a, a client that's like weird or like awkward, like you're stuck with that person for like two, three, four hours. And like, you're like, oh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the break room and like, you know, wash towels, even though you don't even wash your own towels and you like, just try to escape them, you know? And then you have to worry about like someone stealing your product if they're in your studio, but there's just like a lot of things that like people don't really think about. And I loved my studio. I love being a studio um, stylist. Like it was really cool, but Um, there's just a, a lot of like, you're not an unsuccessful stylist if you don't ever make it to having a studio or if you don't end up being a salon owner, like you can be a six or seven figure stylist and work in a salon, work in a commission salon, work in a booth. Like you and I both have mutual friends who are like celebrity stylists or not even celebrities. They're just like busy and they work, you know, with these like, um, high-end salons and a lot of these high-end salons are commission only and they are bringing in. (laughs) a crap load of money and they have like amazing, huge, expensive houses. And, 
they are, they love being a commission stylist because they don't have to have any commitment, like their hands off, they go in, they do their clients, they go home, they don't worry about anything. And so you just really have to figure out like, what is best for you and your personality and your own business. And not, one is not better than the other. And, and even like, um, like chain, chain salons I've been in, you know, cause I educate in all different types of environments, like from schools all the way to like most high end salons. And, uh, I hear a lot of chain salon stylists say like, you know, like, Oh, I want to do this or that. And it's like, I've seen people kill it in these, in these chain salons and make just like a ton of money and have the backup and support and education from, from a company like Ulta or a company like, uh, like JC Penney, where they have that support. And so it really is like that our industry is so like, there's so many facets and so many options that like, like you, you just have to, you know, figure out what, what you like the best and then what what's going to allow you to flourish. It's whether or not you want to manage it yourself, or if you want to have like a, a team that's managing different responsibilities, because that's where management 101, you can always like, you know, uh, give other people responsibilities and let them flourish in that. But uh, the main thing is like what Constance was saying in the very beginning and, and just earlier, like the main part of this that I think Constance and I are both trying to, to press on you today is that if you're really good at doing hair, it doesn't mean that you need to open up a business and do that because those are two separate skill sets. Running a business is way, way different. And running a successful business is a totally different part of your brain even than running a successful chair and servicing your clients. So, and I, just to be fully transparent, I made more money when I worked behind a chair for another salon than I do as a salon owner. Now, the reason why I made that move is because I was ready for different types of responsibilities. Um, I wasn't passionate about working five days a week. Well, actually it was four days a week. Sorry. I wasn't passionate about working four days behind the chair. I exhausted kind of the resources. I, I got to a place where I was like, I feel there was something pulling me and I, I had more responsibilities that were calling me that I wanted to be a part of. And salon ownership for me just was, it was a natural step. It was something that I met somebody at the right time and it had the right feeling. And I just decided this is calling to me. And so don't feel like this pressure that you have to do it or a lot of times when I'm coaching people, they want to do it because they think they're going to make more money. And I promise you, it's not in the beginning. It's kind of like when you buy a house, <laughs> when you buy a house, it costs a lot of money up front. There are some things that you might have to repair. There's some stuff you're going to have to put time and energy into. You're making a commitment. Uh, you can't sell it right away. You have to at least wait two years to get capital in order to get your capital gains. Otherwise you have to pay heavy taxes on it. And even when you sell it. Okay. So you have to also realize that her husband is a realtor. So now she's like speaking with her realtor hat on too. I know. But even like, no, but seriously, like I'm in my third home. And, and the problem is, is that even when you sell your house, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to make money off of it. You know, it's like you have to, there still has to be a time and a patience thing. So you make your money later on, but you have to be, you have to nurture it is my point. You have to nurture something. Anytime you want to get a return on that investment, you have to nurture, nurture it. So anyway, did we stress that enough? You guys? <laughs> yeah. Even if you buy a salon that's like hundred percent done, like there's still always things like I, how many times have you re redecorated Auric? Like I like, even like when we're, when we were shut down during the pandemic, I spent thousands of dollars like redoing the insulation in our ceiling, like redoing our floors, repainting the salon. Like right now I just had to replace, uh, we have a neon sign, which I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have a neon sign. So cool. Look at everything. Um, P.S. If you ever get a neon sign, don't put it in an area that like someone can like touch because it broke. Um, I don't know. Who I, I think it was like lady lady broke it. So, um, and I just basically had to pay for the sign all over again because they had to like re-blow the glass and like put in like the new, like I don't know, stuff that makes it work. And like, there's always, there's always costs and things break, like clients break things, stylists break things. It's just part, you know, salons get like loved, you know, they get like really like used. And so like, you have to replace things. And so, and also like I painted my entire salon white, like who does that? Like that's just setting yourself up for like, that's why I repaint it every year. <laughs>
<laughs> There's like 20 coats of paint. The walls are like closing in. The square footage is getting smaller. So many layers of paint anyway. But yeah, no, all good points. Very valid, valid points. But you know, salon ownership, it's not for the faintest of heart. And it's also okay if you try it out and you decide like, you know, this just wasn't for me. <laughs> it's okay. Like there's no. Yeah. But it's also really cool. Like I don't want to scare anybody either. Like it's also incredibly rewarding and to have a team that you can like curate yourself and like have like have that community. Like when my girls tell me that like the salon feels like their second home and like they like love the team so much, like they're all really truly like there for each other. And, um, it's just like, it, it warms my heart to allow them to have an environment where they feel good, you know, because there are so many times that I felt sick going into the salon, like not my own salon, but like a salon that I'd worked at previously, just dreading like, Oh, so-and-so is here. The owner is here. And just, you, you feel like that anxiety. And so to, you know, to be able to create that culture yourself is amazing. So I don't want to just make it sound like, oh, it's really, really hard. Don't ever do it. It is very hard, but it's also like, if that is something that really you're feeling a calling towards, like follow that calling because like that passion will make up for, you know, the times that you're in Home Depot crying on a pile of lumber. It's, it's true. There are going to be those moments where you t totally have a meltdown. I mean, I have at least one monthly meltdown and it, it feels good. You know, it's like a cleansing, <laughs> not in a weird way. Just like, yeah, I just cleansed myself and now I just feel reborn. <laughs> Usually you call me, you're like, this is going on. I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. It's true. We both call each other when we're having those moments. And like, that's the most, that's the other important thing. You can have friends to, to lean on, but make sure that those friends that you're leaning on, they're, they are people that not only you're going to take advice from, but you're also, you're going to trust them on both sides. Like, I don't know. Sometimes I think we're way too quick to listen to other people who we wouldn't take their advice from, but we'll totally take their critiques. And so I feel, okay, that could be a whole different podcast session in itself. I feel like we're never going to be able to wrap this up because there are so many parts of like the psychology that wraps up into the decisions that we make. And then the fears that like go into it too. And I don't know why I just got like so much more intense about the way I was talking about it, but there, there are, there are a lot of pieces into it. And a lot of people also get imposter syndrome too. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Most people don't know what the heck they're doing until they actually get there. And then they start to figure it out. And they still don't know what they're doing. They're just solving one problem at a time. And they still don't know. Well, and they know what they're doing to some point. I mean, like, obviously like somebody like me, for instance, I would say in the beginning, no clue what I was doing. I had an idea. I thought I knew what I was doing until I started doing it. And then I was like, okay, this part doesn't work for me at all. And then you have to quickly learn. And so either you're putting money into it or you're putting time into it. But either way, in order for something to work, you have to do one or the other. It's not going to just come naturally. I guess that was kind of like the whole point in all of it. Well, and there's always that curveball too. I mean, you've been a salon owner for how long? How, how long has it been? Seven years now. Yes. Okay. And then all of a sudden, like, surprise pandemic. And like, how do you navigate that? You know, like there's always going to be things that are going to be thrown at us that like are new that we're not going to know how to deal with or, you know, a problem that maybe hasn't occurred yet. And, and that's, I think, uh, the biggest piece of advice I could say about like, if you're going to go into salon ownership is like build a community of other salon owner friends and, um, have them as your resource. Because like over the last four years that I've been a salon owner, the amount of phone calls I have had, like with Ambrosia, um, our friend, Michelle Stevenson, who owns, um, Oh my God. Salon 1506, uh, Francis. Um, she's been amazing. She just opened, I think her second salon. Um, and like, so like low wheeler, like so many of our friends who own salons who like, we admire each other and like having that resource of like, you know, bouncing off ideas. Okay. Well, what are you doing? Okay. Well, maybe I'm not going to do it exactly the way they're doing that, but that's like something that I did, hadn't thought of. And so like, you know, kind of having that arsenal of like, hip pocket information to, to help guide you because it's, it's kind of like being a parent. Like you can get all this advice from all these other people about how they did it with their children. But like, until you're in, in it, in the moment, like you have to find out the way that you're going to parent and same as being a, a salon owner, not that like your team is your children, but you, you're still nurturing them. You're still like having to make d big decisions. And, um, and, like what's working for somebody else may not work for you, but it's like really good to like have that resource. Yeah. And what's working for someone else is might not work for you. I love that you said that. I think that's a big one. 
Because I think sometimes people will take advice and think that, or, you know, they just because it didn't work for one person, it doesn't mean that like with your business model, because Constance and I have completely separate business models. So what I might apply to something, maybe an element of it would work for her or not at all. I don't know. So it's like sometimes just like sharing ideas, like what we've done, it, it maybe they won't, maybe Constance wouldn't do it exactly the same way, but maybe it inspires her like, oh, actually, you know, I've been thinking about this, doing this, and maybe I, I'll implement this into it too. And vice versa for her, maybe she'll say something to me and it, it fires off an idea in my head too. So anyway, the, I think the main thing is like, find your people, regardless if you are going to a salon and you're shopping for a salon and deciding where you want your next home to be for a little while, or you're opening your own salon, or you're going into business with another person, that could be an only, a totally different podcast in itself too. <laughs> but regardless, find your people and lean into them a little bit more and trust the process. And yeah, even though salon ownership is not for everyone, it can be gratifying in in a lot of ways, but it can also be really hard. And it, it is a commitment. Like you just stick with it and just see what happens. And I always have a rule for one year. Like if you give something one year and see how you feel at the end of it, and if you feel like you're resenting it, then maybe it's time to to pivot. You know, I hate using that word, but maybe it's time to shift or transfer into something else too. Why do you hate it? Because of friends pivot. <laughs> But pivot because probably because I heard it so many times. I'm just like, oh, there's that word again. There's that word again. And also because Sonny, whenever we're talking about things, he's like, you just have to pivot. Like he makes fun of me and all my girlfriends. <laughs> so are there like certain words? He's like, oh, you got to manifest um, and pivot, pivot into manifesting. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're like, what would happen in Middle Earth? I know. I'm like, just go watch your Lord of the Rings. <laughs> also, P.S. When you guys heard my baby crying earlier, there is somebody who is with him. My husband is with him. So he's not just like in the other rooms, <laughs> just in case anybody was like a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and if you want me to come back, leave a comment or like whatever you're supposed to do on podcasts. I don't even know. Like very valid point. If you guys leave us a review and please, please tell us more like what you want to hear more from, because we are going to have Constance back. It's just, you know what you want to hear from us and when <laughs> if you want to follow me at constance robbins on instagram and tiktok us, let's hang out again soon uh let's have constance back yes please do give us all the feedback on what you would like to hear more of and all your reviews are definitely appreciated and we will for sure give you a shout out as well i want to thank you so much for your time and attention today don't forget we're here for you each step of the way find more info about the courses coaching and community we have linked in our show notes below and we look forward to catching you guys next week